Welcome to Good Catholic Great Stories, where we explore fascinating stories from and for the world of Catholicism. Hi, and welcome to Good Catholic Great Stories. I'm your host, Christian Tappy. Today we're joined by Noelle Maring. Uh, she's an editor for TheologyofHome.com and the co-author of the books Theology of Home and Theology of Home 2. Her writing can be found at multiple outlets, including National Review, National Catholic Register, and EWTN. She is the author of the soon-to-be-released book Awake, Not Woke, and a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C. And before all that, she's a wife and mother of six children. Welcome, Noel. Thanks for having me, Christian. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so where did you stash your kids? Are they back in school? <laughs> They're all in school, actually. Okay. They've been in person school throughout this year, which oh, has wow. been fantastic. That's great. Yeah, yeah so uh, I've done some recording at my house. I think we both have six kids. Um, <clears throat> and it's funny because uh, they wander in. And most people like it. Uh, I remember, uh, I think at the beginning of COVID, there was that guy who was doing the TV interview and like his kid busted in and the wife was like frantically dragging him out. Um, that was a gem. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny because everyone, um, everyone responded positively to that. And I think it kind of gets in a little bit to what we'll talk about later about, you know, kind of changing ideas on the home, but it's, you know, goes a little bit, uh, off the beaten path. It's not quite the Catholic idea, but we can get into that a, a little bit later. Um, so I just want to jump in. You co-wrote Theology of Home um, with Carrie Grass. Um, I had the pleasure of working with you guys on that title uh, back when uh, I was with Tam Books. Um, and I can say that the idea really resonated with people. Um, I know that the, the popularity of the book has been huge um, to the point where we have a sequel. Uh, and also the website, theologyofhome.com, is just gets a ton of traffic. I know you and Carrie have products all over the place, too, that people are just, are just eating up. So <coughs> for those who don't know, though, just give us kind of a 50,000 foot view. What is theology of home? I think sometimes people hear the, that phrase and they can kind of put it together. But what does what does that mean? So theology of home is a phrase that Carrie came up with actually one day when she was running on a treadmill, my co-author, and she is a prolific writer. But it occurred to her one day she'd been trying to think about how to do women's media in a new way that felt fresh and engaging and and would kind of a, a address things that women care about, but in, in a way that um, hadn't been quite done before and felt like there was a real need for that. And it occurred to her while she was listening, she was listening to the song about a homecoming. And it occurred to her that we are all so moved by stories of people coming home, you know, w whether or not it's like a, a military man coming home and being greeted by his family or um, so many movies about these things or songs. And it just, uh, it really it was striking that so much of our lives are just us trying to get home again, that we are trying to, you know, both literally and also supernaturally, that we are looking for a place where we can really belong and where we are valued, not for in a utilitarian way for what our function is or what we're doing, but rather just valued for who we are. Um, and and, and it's, that provides a certain safety, but it also ennobles, like engenders a certain courage and enables us to go out into the world with a certain confidence um, in, in this sort of foundation that we have that was given to us, you know, starting as children. Um, and I think we really sense when we didn't receive that there, we realized how much was, was off. So, so the home, I think is, is, is so far, far more important than I think we've given language to, um, especially in the last few decades. Uh, and so it was, theology of home is really sort of an, a, a trying to give dignity to something that deserves so much dignity and also correct a certain error that we see on both sides. One being like an extreme, the extreme of materialism where we think of our homes as like a showpiece or something that can glorify us or, you know, kind of in a com competitive way. And the other uh, extreme being where we think of the material world and our home life and making our homes beautiful as being sort of a superficial or trite a way to spend our time um, you know, at, at, as, and, and distinct from our real, the real stuff of life, which is the spiritual life. And, you know, as Catholics, we are incarnate, we're embodied beings. And so just understanding that this, the material world in our homes in particular, really are an important way to, to, to channel beauty into our home life um, and create all these, uh, all these, all these things that, you know, that, that, that the human person needs um, uh, in a way that is actually oriented towards pointing us all towards towards God and to our ultimate end um, rather than to ourselves. So that was the impetus for the first book. And that's why we had so many beautiful pictures and um, these meditations was just to sort of uh, reimagine and, and, and really see the why behind the importance of what we do in the home. Yeah, that's great. I love thinking about the home. You, you kind of said it's a place to, to nurture, but also 
um, a place to go out from. So I kind of like think of it almost like a home base, right? It's not that you just always hunker down there, but it's you're you're building up, um, you know, your your life in God uh, to also go out of the home, but then come back and 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 have that that formation and, and that love in the home. Um, so you and Carrie have just been named uh, fellows at the Ethics and Public Policy Center for a Theology of Home project, which sounds pretty awesome. Uh, what? Tell, tell me what you guys are going to do there. Well, we are, first of all, thrilled and so honored. Ryan, and I've been a fan of Ryan Anderson for quite a while, and Carrie's known him in, in person, is friend, friends with him. But uh, he, when he took over the Ethics Institute, he, he, he reached out to us, and it was so deeply such a deep honor and so exciting to think that he, you know, saw value and his wife's a, a big theology of home fan too. So that might've put a little bit of a bug in his ear, but she claims it was, and he was on board right away. So, and I trust that he's, yeah. he really is an insightful leader, I think for the, um, the center. Um, and so, so we're, what we're hoping to do is just, you know, he, he's committed to defending the family, both in policy and also, you know, defensively, offensively, but also in, in the family is a practical um, daily uh, unit that has to know how to do that well. And so he brought us on sort of to kind of expand and expose the Theology of Home project and, and broaden it so that we might be able to sort of add that element, that really human element to this, all the policy discussions and important work that they're, they're already doing. So, so you know, we're, we have so many ideas percolating that are we're hoping to you know sort of hone and figure out. But we've got uh, we're broadening uh, both our advertisement. We have some books, uh, new books are coming out. Um, there's some talk of some other projects that would be a bit of a new direction that I'm not sure I can quite talk about yet. But um, all really exciting and and uh, yeah, we're thrilled to find an institutional home at Ethics. It's a, it's a great place. That is great, and it, it's it's so good to see. Uh, family be at the center of public policy and, and, and try to eke its way in a, in a good, in a good way into politics. It, it, it's too often it's, you know, kind of devoid of, of the family. It's individuals or it's big businesses and getting that injected yeah, again. Yeah, I'm sort great. of a disembodied, right? Po yeah. where politics can easily just become sort of talking points and right. there's, all, there's no flesh to it. And, you know, I think that, that, that we're at a time when things are sort of trans changing a lot. There's a lot of transitions and transformation happening amongst mm -hmm both parties and it's exciting to see in some ways what what will come out of that because it can get really stayed and and putting the flesh and the family back into yeah. these discussions I think is going to be at the forefront and crucial if if, if it's going to move forward in, in a positive way yeah absolutely that 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 sounds really exciting um jumping off from there uh theology of home Two, uh the follow-up book to the first theology of home is goes kind of into Homemaking, right? How to build that home. Um, that's a word that's kind of used a lot, uh, and people use it in different ways. Um, so we'll, we'll get into that. But I thought the way the book started off was was brilliant and a good place for us to start, too. It starts with a quote um, from Betty Friedan, who was a uh, feminist author in the 1960s, kind of the second wave of feminism. Um, and she, she calls that women have an ache with no name, um, the ache with no name. So the ache was taken though, um, as we need to get out of the house, right? Women need to get out of the home. Um, and really, I think you and, and Carrie in the book say that that's not really what the ache is. What, what, what is the ache that I think she rightly, uh, put her finger on, uh, but maybe wrongly diagnosed. Yeah, no, it's uh, such a fascinating question and we don't get into too much of this about it, but I, you know, it really is sort of a replacement for original sin. I think in, mm. in a certain way, you know, that you're the new, um, the new thing that you're, you're kind of this new sadness that you kind of experience, um, is like an existential understanding of your oppression. Um, and so, and so, so we touch upon that, but not, um, not too much because we don't want the book to be too, you know, po political. It's more, um, supposed to be meditative, but, uh, but yeah, so the, I think she was pointing to that though, that there is a sadness of woman that is a, a recognition that she is oppressed in some way. Um, and what Carrie and I are trying to reorient is that, you know, I think that the, it's a true human sadness, right? That is the, a, a lot that we recognize that we have a, this longing that cannot be fulfilled in the, the stuff of life. Um, but it is through the stuff of life that we can come to God. And that that's ultimately where our longing can rest. But um 
Yeah. So I, and that's why I think her movement was so powerful, Betty Friedan, is that she was tapping into something that's really human and, and, and a real experience. Um, and, and then, and then twisting it, you know, and then replacing it, locating it somewhere that it, it ought not to have been. Um, and, and I think it was hugely effective. And I think that's, you know, in large part why we're writing this book is because of what these women started in that, um, in that, in that shift. Uh, and it, to the point where now I think we accept it so, so um, without question that it's almost, it's almost like a new language to kind of fight against it because there's, mm-hmm. you know, there's, we're so in deeply in acceptance of the girl power movement and finding like all of these values in our, in our power and being powerful that it's, 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 it really takes a, a bit of undoing to kind of think outside of that, that sort of, that sort of box that is, is so culturally pervasive. Um, so yeah, that's why I think it was good to start with that quote and to um, it put it in a nice perspective that oriented the rest of the book. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to get back in, in a minute to that idea of power, but um, it, it, it's interesting, you know, you, you say it's been so deeply ingrained, right? And I think that that's true. And, and I think what I, one thing I like about um, all the work that you guys have done with The Audrey of Home is that it, you don't, it's not something like, no, all, all women need to get back in the home and in the kitchen and that's all they do, right? There's <coughs> this idea that women do have these particular virtues and strengths and things like that and they're at place uh they're they're they can be in business they can do these jobs but i think the idea of that ache that we talked about it's not filled by that right it's not necessarily that that's bad uh, because it isn't at all but that it's not it's not uh it's not calming that ache because the ache is something different right the ache uh, as you mm-hmm. talked about and so you you kind of just keep searching and searching and searching i think like it, it you know, to me as a, as a man, it's the same thing, right? You can go and fill that ache like, oh, I need to, if I make more money or if I, you know, if I get this new car or whatever, it's going to fill that ache and it doesn't. Um, and so then that's kind of the, the real danger of it. Not that women are, are in the workplace, but that um, they're just still, they're unfulfilled. Um, <clears throat> but, I, I, you know, on the other hand, you see kind of um, a thanklessness uh, sometimes in motherhood, I think. Um, and... Uh, that can be kind of a draw to the other side. So, you know, you go to the grocery store with you know, your six kids and it can be overwhelming sometimes. And, uh, you know, people give you looks and why is this kid running around? And then, you know, even at home, kids are notoriously ungrateful sometimes. So there is a certain thanklessness to being a mother. Um, how, do you, how do you talk to people about... Um, working through that um, and, and instead of, you know, kind of dwelling in that thanklessness or trying to do something different, um, embrace that. Yeah, oh, that's such a great question. I, I mean, you know, I think y- you're not going to resolve it by trying to work within that framework of val- like how you receive val- validation, right? Like that the answer is to rethink the framework. So, and I think that's part of the the modern problem for all of us is that, um, you know, the, 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 it, we've really reversed the structure of significance in our lives. So we've made our public lives become almost everything, you know, men, women, teenagers, everyone, everyone has this struggle. Um, and it's exacerbated, right, with so much social media, not to, um, not that social media doesn't have its place and is, can be a good avenue. But, um, but, you know, once we start associating that, you know, our, the thing that is the most um the thing that's most going to uh, root us and make a, and make us be able to go out in the world and live fruitful and flourishing lives is our prayer lives. And that's the most hidden thing uh, in our lives. Right. But there's a, such a trick of, you know, I, I, I struggle with this. I'm sure everyone struggles with this. You try to like kneel down for spend half an hour in meditation, meditative prayer, everything about your, your, your mind is just like, Oh, I should be doing this. I should be fixing that. I should be cleaning that. I should be doing something else, you know? Yeah. Um, and the more that's it, and, and the, and I think that, that the, the, le, the less value we place on our hidden life and that's just, we're just going to be, you know, lemmings for that, that temptation, you know? Um, and, but in, in the home is a piece of that, right? The home is, uh, is a more hidden life than our public lives by definition. Uh, and, and I, it's like you, you were saying before, so beautifully, I think, you know, it's, this is a temptation, not just about women, it, but it's men too, you know, that, and husbands, to understand that their career is subordinate to their home life, that's a struggle as well, but one that, you know, that we all have to learn. Um, so, so, so yeah, I think that the, it's, it's just, 
such a shift to place the value on the hidden life that 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 life deserves Mm -hmm. um and it's harder and harder for us to change that metric but so someone's struggling with feeling like what they're doing is important and we get these emails and letters all the time from women saying like i i understood what i was doing but i didn't really understand why it was noble or why it was dignified and that's what you know theology of home helped me with which you know we're so so grateful to be able to convey that message um, but I think that why is so important, right? Like you, and it forms your daily life because the daily life of motherhood is really quiet and really oftentimes feels banal or repetitive. And, um, if you don't have that, why, and that understanding of that great dignity, then you're going to get affected by what people think of you or right. whether or not you feel like you're doing something significant. So yeah, connecting these dots is important for all of us, but I think in particular for women in the throes of young children and you know this, this these are the big questions that loom large in their in their daily life yeah no i think there's a, a a little vignette in the book um i can't remember who it was a, a friend of of one of yours or carrie's um who uh when they had their first child was asked you know are you excited to be a mother and she said N- I don't know, but I'm excited. I'm excited for this person, right? And that I think, was me, actually. That was my okay. sister asked me. She's like, uh, don't you just love motherhood? Yeah. I said, I don't know. I love my baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I thought that was such a beautiful way of putting it because it, it kind of, it really cuts to the core of it. And I think people understand that naturally. But, the, you know, we have these terms like homemaker and, and, and motherhood, which are good. I mean, motherhood obviously is a good term, but it's been structured into, it's been, can be twisted sometimes into like, the person who does the laundry, the person who cooks, the person who drives the kids to practices. And that stuff, devoid of the person, right, mm. gets really tough uh, because you're just you're, you're kind of running around um, doing all these tasks and it's, it, 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 it's hard. But I like looking at the person because it opens up this concept of love, right? And why are you doing these things? Um, well, it's because you love, right? You love that person. You love your husband. You love your wife. You love your children. Um <coughs> And I think that that can open it up, but it's interesting because uh, there's another quote in the book um, from C.S. Lewis, and I think it says um, uh, something like, if you love deeply, you're going to get hurt badly, but it's still worth doing. Um, And then there's another part of that quote that's not in the book, but C.S. Lewis talks about people who protect their heart, right? They they become, they won't open it up for love, and they don't get hurt, they don't get heartbroken, but they just become cold and callous. Um, And so I think this idea of loving deeply, you love the, the person, you love your, your child, um, can give some sense to the toil <laughs> that you go through. So you guys talk a lot about that in the book, but talk about a little bit the, the love aspect, because I think that's the thread that runs through the whole book of, of what really is homemaking. Yeah, no, I think that that's, I love the way you just framed that. And, and, and the thing that I think that that really points to is the fact that ideology is really abstract, you know, but, but love is actually really concrete and really personal. Um, and, and actually I think that that's one of the greatest things that we have going as, you know, as Catholics is that we have really, really have nature on our side and the experience of, I I've known so many women who were really like kind of bristled at the idea of motherhood. And then once they had their first baby, if everything changed, you know, they just thought, well, I, I, I just want, I don't want to fit into this ideological mold. I just want to be uh, per- that best person I can be for this particular person who who now I'm in love with, you know, and that's why that was so powerful. Um, but um, I, I I don't remember now your question after I got off that tangent. I'm sorry. No, no, sorry. <laughs> the just love, the love aspect. Yeah, yeah just so how I mean, that's the through line. It's actually interesting to your your point a little bit earlier ties into this, which is. Um, you know, it's, I, I think it was really important to us to not have this be kind of a really role-based book where we're trying to be throwbacks to the 1950s and we say like, okay, well, womanhood is does this and manhood does this and these these really strict categories, which in some ways I think are sort of um, tend to be a maybe a more, a more Protestant um, way, a way of approaching mm-hmm. male and female. Um, whereas I think, you know, as Catholics, we understand that there is, and, and, and many Protestants understand this too, um, that, that it's a deeper definition of what it is to be a man and a woman. And, as, and, and it's less, Abigail, um, Abigail Favalli made a great point the other day online where she was saying, you know, it's not like two halves that connect like puzzle pieces. It's rather two whole persons who connect synergistically, you know, that they, and they are distinct and they are different and their natures are different. Um, but it's, but there's far more freedom, I think, in the sense that, you know, um, 
that, you know, my husband cooks, he's very manly. He's a wonderful chef and I am not. I, I, if there's a home project, sometimes I'll rewire a light in the ceiling, you know, whereas that's not something he would be inclined to do. Um, but he's very manly and I'm very womanly. And it, the tasks are less important than, um, than the, the deeper realities of, 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 our, of our nature and what we express about the love of God. Um, so, but yeah, but it's finding that thread. So it seemed to us that, that that's why we, Theology of Home 2 is really important to us to profile different women at different ages and stages in life. So we have like an, a grandmother and a first time mother and a working mother and a professional, you know, an architect mother, a stay at home mother, many kids, because we wanted to show that it wasn't that it all looked one way. And oh, and also like a bear, you know, a woman who can't, couldn't have children or a single woman. It, the, the more common thread is what you're referencing, which is a love and a willingness to serve God in whatever capacity that he calls us to do that and whatever that will look like. Um, and that, that was the deeper thread. That was the common thread throughout um, these women's lives. Yeah, that's great. I was, I was actually just going to mention that next to that. That's one thing that I really love about the book are the stories of various women. I think it, it shows, again, as you said, there's different ways and different paths. But I also thought it kind of got to this idea of there, there's an objection oftentimes with um, when people are kind of resisting motherhood or family of, well, I'm going to lose my identity. Um, it, and that gets back to the, the titles and things like that. But I thought that the story showed that, no, you don't lose your identity, right? You're, you're still, you still have your personality. You're still unique. Um, and oftentimes it's even heightened and enhanced by, by having, you know, children and, and a family and, and creating a home or at least working and working for others. Um, but I think we should talk about that a little bit too, the, the kind of this idea of a suffering servant. Um, we talked about that a little bit in the book, but, um, you know, I know growing up, uh, my mother was definitely a suffering servant and I see that now and I didn't see it when I was, I didn't see it when I was a kid, right? You, you understand as you, as you grow up that, you know, what your parents have done for you, especially, especially our mothers. But, um, in the moments, you know, it, it can be tough. Any tips, you know, as a mother for learning to suffer well, um, it's not something we really love to talk about, but I think it's a crucial element to being a mother and a parent. Mm. Yeah. I mean, in so many ways, I feel like in my own experience, it was really, really a shift where I just started to understand suffering differently. I remember just thinking for the first few years of motherhood, it felt like such a shock to me. I had not mm. been a babysitter. I just had no experience. I came from a small family and this felt like a new life. Um, and, and I felt like, you know, my husband would come home and I've, I, I felt like I need to express how put upon I was today. <laughs> I've had a hard day and here's why. And then that is, you know, I wanted to, I was fighting so much against my suffering that I was wearing as a badge of honor, you know, right. um, and losing any uh, sort of redemptive value in the process. <laughs> and at one point I just remember he was coming home and I thought, I, I, for this pathetic, but I, for the first time thought about what's his experience, like coming home to a wife who's just having a litany of complaints, you know, it's probably horrible. Like that would feel truly horrible. And, um, and that really reoriented me, um, in my mindset and just thinking, why, why do I feel this need to, um, to, to you know, and I, I think I, what I realized that I was not fighting my circumstances, I was fighting myself, right? And I think that, that in motherhood, I thought I think about that, or, or you know, especially when the kids were young, I thought about that a lot. Just that, what's my real battle here? Is it that the kids are unruly, or is it that I am either not orderly enough to kind of have like established order in my home, or is it that I am too controlling and I, I need to learn how to you know understand? The nature and the natural messiness of family life and you know what what's actually the problem here um and those types of questions really help me to sort of process in the in the moment um but you know obviously the the the, the biggest answer is you know is is your prayer life and, and and the sacraments you know confession has been a, going to regular confession is a huge game changer for me because yeah. it constantly is helping you with that that question what am i fighting i'm fighting myself i'm fighting right. my sin and so how, how can i reorient myself and, and grow in love and that's how you know that's God, it's a it's a it's an unglamorous answer, but that is <laughs> the the way that God walks us through life that and brings us closer to Him. Oh, that, that's great. That struggle for love. Yeah, and I, I I like the unglamorous answer um, <clears throat> because so much <laughs> of this is unglamorous, right? So another thing I love about the book, the Audrey Home Two, and also the the first book is uh, you mentioned this the pictures of you know people and families at home, and I think they're. Um, what I love about them is that they're they're obviously beautiful and, and it shows kind of a peacefulness or 
um, a place centered on God. But it shows real people doing real things, and it's it's uh, it's, it's 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 normal looking. I'll be careful here because I don't want to offend anybody. But uh, you know, you look on Instagram uh, and and places like that, and you I think there can be a frustration because you see people who have these perfect, you know, manicured ho- homes and things like that, or their children are playing in like their pressed linen outfits or whatever. And I, I'm imagining putting my kids in, in pressed linen ever, let alone to play. <laughs> um, but it, 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 I think it can be frustrating um, for, especially, especially mothers who are, who are home with the children trying to kind of incorporate this idea of, theology of home and bring beauty um, and and peacefulness into their lives. But you made a good point about um, chaos, right? Natural chaos and, and this uh, the unglamorous answer. So how does, what are some practical tips for actually bringing that to into the home, but while acknowledging, you know, it's not always going to be perfect. It's going to be messy. Hmm. That's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, in some ways the Instagram example is instructive because you know, I, I, I appreciate that there's a whole host of different types of people on Instagram. Like I, I, the people with their kids in linen outfits, I just think they're trying to do something beautiful and yeah. put something beautiful out there and people draw inspiration from that. And, you know, and, that, and that's their niche, you know, and there's other people who are just kind of showing the real messiness of life. Yeah. And, and that's great too. I think that we, there's probably a place for all of those different sorts of feeds. And if it's something is driving the, the, the viewer, you know, upsetting them, then they just can, you know, right. I always say you can curate your own feed. You know? right. um, but for personally, um, you know, I think that the, the, the question is whether or not I'm doing something for my own glorification or something that's truly serving my family and the, and God. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I, you know, if anytime, if, if I have a tendency to be too controlling in, in, in one season of life, then that, that, that tends to be something that is, I'm using maybe my children to reflect something on me and to serve my own ego. Um, if I tend to be too disorderly, you know, maybe I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, if the root cause is laziness or that, that I am, you know, selfish in certain other ways, I'd rather devote my attention to something that feels more fulfilling for me rather than the, my prior duty, which is, you know, make, maintaining some order in my home. So, you know, I think that that is just this quite, cur- con- there's no, there's no, there's really a cu- only a custom answer, which is that each person's got to figure that out in their own soul. And you only, you only learn that through a prayer life and through confession, or you, or you best learn that through a prayer life and, and, and through confession. Um, but yeah, it is tricky because it's not, there, it doesn't, again, doesn't look the same for every person. Some people's family lives just are, lend themselves more easily to a certain type of way of being and others lend themselves to more, you know, my girls are in athleisure, I, I think almost every day. They're in like basketball shorts you know? <laughs> and I try to buy cute outfits for them. It's like, yeah. And I just decided a long time ago, it's not the hill I'm going to die on. You know, they you have to wear a dress for mass and certain times they have to look a certain way, but you know, clothing's just not going to be the, the thing that I battle and they're tomboys and, you know, I want them to embrace that while they're, while they're there. And, and as they get a little bit older, they tend to want to wear a little bit, something more fashionable. So, you know, let that happen on their own time, but different people have different priorities and, you know, and, and I think that there's room for that type of difference too. Yeah, absolutely. It's hilarious. I love, I just love kids dressing and like what they decide to put on. I have an, an eight year old who wears like athletic shorts and like a button down shirt all the time. And I was like, buddy, <laughs> he's like, I look great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's got both, right? He can, he can, it's, it's like the mullet of, uh, uh of, of styles, but uh, it's on the top. <laughs> that's right. Um, great. That's awesome. So I wanted to get back briefly to this idea that you talked about earlier about power. Um, there's a, there's a great, um, there's a great part in the book where we talk about how women and mothers have tended over the the past few decades to trade fruitfulness for power. Um, Could you explain kind of what you mean by, by that? What's the difference and and what, what is the trade that's been made? Sure. Well, uh, I mean, we don't get into this, although my new book gets into this, but um, Carrie and I both done uh, a lot of studying and writing about, you know, the shift that, that Marx, Karl Marx introduced, and really it, it, the neo-Marxist movement introduced this understanding in all of our minds that are the point of life is power, that everything is, all relationships are a zero-sum power struggle. Either you have power or you do not, and if you do not, then your life's goal is to spend trying to invert that system and achieve power. Um, and so I think, you know, women, just like many, you know, it's been spread across many different categories of people, but women in particular have been affected by this um this uh, seed that was planted a while ago um, of ideology. And um, 
and it really sets us up for a lot of anxiety, right? Because if you're, if you see your relationship with your husband and your children as being a power struggle, even if you don't say it explicitly, that message is still kind of absorbed. Um, it's just the ambient message in the society. Um, then you're going to spend a lot of time sort of resentful, um, comparing yourself to other people, uh, anxious, you know, anxious about what you have and what you don't have, and um, and 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 prone to seeing yourselves not as collaborators in our harmonious, you know, relationships, but rather as antagonists, um, even in small, subtle ways. I think that message creeps up into women. I, and I hear young women, especially all the time now, uh, where, Carrie gets amazing messages about her Auntie Mary Exposed book, where women will just be introduced to it and think, I didn't realize that I was doing this, but I really was uh, sort of in an antagonistic relationship with my husband. Um, so, so, and we get that a lot about the theology of home books too, just that they, they just didn't see the dignity here. So it's so, so the shift that we're introducing is one of, you know, what we're talking about already, love, service, and also this word fruitfulness, which is sort of a kind of a clunky word, I think now, right? Like we don't use the word, are you fruitful? <laughs> it sounds really biblical, maybe old fashioned or something, but it really is just this stellar um, metaphor, you know, gardening in general, I think is such a stellar metaphor that's been maybe used, um, you know, and I'm not going to say anything probably that revolutionary here, but this sense of that there's an art to it, there's a craft to it, that there's a hiddenness to it, that something germinates, that something eventually, you know, you see the fruit of it come out, but that it takes patience, it takes care, and it takes things that are out of control, like the sun, the weather, you know, um, you know, and those, how those are real, um, metaphors for for the the effect effects of god in our lives and the holy spirit um and that the gardener is really kind of just bringing something into fruition that already was you know um that the gardener is necessary these actions are necessary but really god is the the, the great gardener and the um who, who who is really enabling this whole process uh but that it's also something worth devoting time to and i and that was something interesting that carrie and i talk about a lot that you know anything that you really that we we value T- putting a ton of time and a ton of work in all these other areas of our lives. Like if we want to have a high end career, we want to run a marathon. We want to, you know, have a beautiful garden for you too. You know, we, we don't, we don't think of that as being drudgery or slave work, but for some reason the, this project of having a, a, a happy home life, one that's fruitful and that creates ripples into the world as our children grow up and, um, and affect the affect world and, and their children and their children, you know, th- these are legacies that are, hidden but in quiet but they're actually like the things that are you know changing culture you know for yeah. good for good or for bad um and so the the toil and the time that that the woman spends you know nurturing these important projects somehow we don't dignify like we do you know these other these other parts of life and why is that so um so yeah so there was all structured around that metric though of power versus fruitfulness that's great. No, I, I do love the gardening metaphor. It, it, it is perfect. And fruitfulness is kind of clunky, but I, it works, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's really what it is. So I, I, I do love that, that aspect of the book and kind of explaining that. Um, quickly, I want to talk about um, the role of community in all of this. So we talk about you know, the home, right? And, and we can, you said early on that there's an extreme of just kind of withdrawing into the home. So we have the, you know, the idea of going out and evangelizing, but also just communities of families and homes coming together. Um, how do you see that as uh, as helping out this project of becoming a homemaker, bringing you know, the theology of home into your, into your own home? Yeah, you know, I think it's super important. And, um, you know, in some ways I feel like this is a value of, you know, of, inst- of something like Instagram. So a lot of women, I happen to live in a place where there's a great community of uh, families that are similarly minded, um, but but a lot of women don't have that, and I think you know that that's something that's a really beautiful part of the of on, of the online world is that yeah. there have been real communities that I I think g- g- plunge more of a depth than we would imagine in some ways, um, just because they are able to give each other support and encouragement and all these things. Um, but, but I think it's you know as, as simple as women like to see another life embodied, right? Like you want right. to you don't want to just hear that motherhood is good. You actually want to see other people doing that. And I remember as a first time mom, um, I just was, I, I learned how to be a mom by having mom friends who were really good at it, you know, and are further along better that, at it than I was. And I, and then in those moments of frustration or when I was losing my patience, I would think, 
well, what would my friend Hope do and how would she handle this situation? And, and I would, I could picture her being patient and not losing her cool and just, you know, maybe distracting and singing a song or something. I don't know, whatever it was, but um, I think that sort of embodiment and example is huge and, 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 and how women and how women learn, how all humans learn. But I, for some reason, I think it's particularly compelling for, for women to, to see an embodiment of womanhood and motherhood that they can admire and learn from. That's great. Um, so, all right, the book is mostly about <clears throat> motherhood and homemaking, but uh, I'm a dad, and we have some other dads and husbands who are who are watching and listening. What's, from your perspective, what's one thing that um, husbands, fathers can do um, to help um, bring, you know, this theology of home to bear uh, in their own homes? That's such a good question. Um, I mean, I think that it's a. This is another clunky word, but I think that men really need to understand what their uh, what their um, authority in the home looks like that there is and I don't mean this and I think as soon as you say the, that language people immediately started thinking of like this oppression or repression and um, I actually mean it and I was just in a conversation with actually with a, a, a woman and she was sort of talking about patriarchy and stuff and and I was saying you know I think that I understand why you're talking about that because we have this idea of this overbearing man, you know, that comes to our imagination very quickly. But in the reality of family life, you know, my husband being manly in the home, it oftentimes looks like, well, I'm postpartum. So he's going to take care of the kids and let me take a nap. And, you know, it's very, it's Christ's leadership is a servant leadership. Um, But it also, there's this other part that I think is so important, which is men should really be um, so invested in the spiritual life of their family and I think that there's a, there's there's something that happens quickly when a man is detached from the spiritual life of his family, where it becomes in the children's mind just a womanly thing. It's dis- in, dismissed in that way. Like mm-hmm. sons see that as that's not what, what manliness is. That's sort of a soft, sentimental thing. And I think what a man brings to religion and to the spiritual life in the family is this a, a aspect of heroism that girls and boys should be aspiring to. Right? I mean, they're, they're the female saints were heroes too. But, the, but there is something about a manly embodiment that is particularly brings to it uh, just this image of, of strength, um, you know, and, and, and women bring that too. And men can bring a nurturing element to their spirituality too. And, but women maybe are more iconog- like an, an icon of nurturing. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're, they're, both ex- they're both expressions. They both overlap and they both are similar, but they embody the spiritual life and what 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 it looks like to follow Christ for their children in particular ways that are as man as woman um, and both are crucial and I think that men oftentimes I you know can write it off as being kind of where their their wife kind of takes over mm-hmm. and I think that's a real detriment um, to family life uh, so yeah I would just say that men taking initiative and ownership over the spiritual life in the family is a huge huge deal yeah I think that's great great advice I know, I know even in our family when you know it, the boys take it much better when it's my idea to pray the rosary or, or make a visit or something like that than they do uh when mom does it to just kind of get into that age and they want to be they want to be manly and they want to be like me and so it's important to show that well to be like me you, you you should also have a prayer life um and and do these things and it is manly so that's wonderful advice thank you for that um <coughs> I'm going to try to shift here. We'll see. We'll see how I do with this, uh, with this segue, but I wanted to get into your new book a little bit. Um, and I think it kind of, um, can bloom out of this. You talked about, um, you know, men and women and we have, you know, our natures, um, but also it's not as clearly defined, you know, men can be nurturing as well, but it's, it's more hardwired into women to be nurturing. Um, But it's it's tough to say even that today, right? Uh, because it's n- it's not woke. Uh, it's not you know. There's even though we acknowledge you know there's differences and men can be manly in many different ways. Um, you gotta kind of take that whole cloth, right? It either gender is is nothing and it's a, it's a construct or not. Um, and so I think that we're kind of in a battle right now um, with this culture and that goes against what we're trying to build in our homes of, and it, it really to me, it's almost a religious war, right? The, the kind of the woke culture is, uh, is a religion or probably more accurately a kind of a cult. Um, and that's why, uh, it, you know, to me it becomes so hard to fight against because they have their dogmas too, and you can't 
break through that. So I did want to talk a little bit about your new book. It's coming out in May uh, called Awake, Not Woke. Um, <clears throat> and just ask you kind of, especially with children, um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about building up our homes um, and we want to uh, keep them protected and innocent, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, you know, the need to, to be prepared uh, to, to kind of deal with deal with these issues. So how do you, <clears throat> how do you do that? How do you protect a child's innocence in the home, build up this, this home, but also kind of fight against this woke culture that's just, it's not even creeping into our society anymore. It's, it's, it's here. Um, what's, a, what's the strategy to do that? Oh, gosh, it's such a challenge, isn't it, for everyone, I'm sure. Um, you know, I think first you have to realize that you are, what you're fostering inside the homes is the, the first and prior step, right? It's not that we are kind of, you know, at a defensive crouch, we're constantly warding off like the attacks of the world. Rather, it's like we're actually fostering and creating something super positive in our family life. Um, you know, family culture that is, you know, um, you know, has a personality and a character and, and, a, and a culture um, that will connect them and and ground them and see as pleasant and good um, what 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 they were introduced to. And I, you know, I I think one of the the most important things is that 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 culture should be full of joy. Um, you know, that family life is far too serious to be dour. <laughs> and I and I think there's a real stereotype that big family life is kind of severe or, you know, dismal. Um, and but and I think that's a really detriment, a real detriment to the kids remaining in the faith is that, you know, we're we're our natures want are attracted to pleasure. We want something that's fun and light and cheerful. Um, and so we have to if the more that we can establish that kind of ethos in our family life amidst you know the structure and the discipline and you know that we pray and we do these are the things that we do but we do them out of joy and out of love um so that's the first thing the second thing is that we have to realize that there really is innocence to protect right that there actually is and this is one of the one of the darker um things i discovered in researching my book is i, I sort of knew just um, casually, but um, there really is a real um, effort to attack innocence. That mm -hmm. that actually is uh, intrinsic to the woke movement. Um, the corruption of innocence is part and parcel of what the, the effort is as far as the ideology goes, maybe not as far as, you know, your uncle Sam, who happens to be woke, and I'm sure he's not thinking, I want to go out and attack some innocence, but <laughs> the ideology really does, um, is oriented towards that. And so I think we have to realize that there's something that we do have to protect and that there are efforts, you know, um, more pronounced possibly than there were, you know, in generations past. Um, and they're, because they're more pervasive and they're more accepted, they're more mainstream. Um, but that, that, that is something that we have a solemn duty to, to protect. So, you know, I mean, we are really careful, try to be really careful about phones, um, internet stuff, you know, there all these practical things that people can, you know, I don't write about that, you know, type of practical thing in my book, but, um, but yeah, I think that that is a key part of what you're, you're asking. Yeah. Yeah, and the, I don't want to give, I don't want to get too much into it. I'll let people buy the book when it comes out. But um, there's one last thing is that there's this idea, I think, that we have this clash, right? And we have people on, on this side, um, on our side of the of the aisle, and then you have the woke culture. And it's just, you kind of run full speed at each other, and then you hit, like, I don't know, like mountain goats fighting, and then you just bounce off. Like, they, they're, the dialogue is really tough uh, because uh, you know, they have their kind of do woke dogmas and, that, and that's it, right? Um, and it, it's tough to, to crack that. It seems like we're not coming from the same starting point, we're on the same first principles. But I think the, the, um, the idea that you're kind of getting at with the book is to take this on a personal level um, and, and work, through the, work through it that way. Can you explain a little bit more about, about that idea? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the personalist approach is sort of the antidote to all of this ideology because it is so abstract. Um, so, you know, you, you, we can't we can't really expect to go out and just clash with people or, or argue with them, you know, which I thought for years that I could do. <laughs> it turns out you can't argue someone into to the faith or even the yeah. truth. Um, but that we're actually, you know, just called with our children and our husband and our spouses, but then also with our neighbors and our old friends and, you know, people from all who, who come across our path that we are called just to love them and to enter into real, true, authentic friendship with them. Um, not for the sake of their conversion, but just for the sake of um, who they are and for loving them and what we can learn from them too. Mm -hmm. And that can kind of cut, cut into the arrogance. I think that we can sometimes maybe can be a temptation and knowing that we have the truth and that they're wrong and we're right, you know, and, um, 
and, and you know we have to approach that with more humility than that at the same time i think that it's really important to have courage so um i have a ton of dear secular friends and some of them have been so like wonderful um and just understanding i'm writing this book and the, the subtitle is a Christian response to the cult of progressive ideology. So if you're a progressive and you're my good friend, you're kind of like, Oh, could you have chosen a different subtitle? Maybe? <laughs> but um, I do have some friendships that I feel like have been there. There's been a bit more distance. And I think it's because there are things that have erupted in the culture over the past year that really have brought these, um, these, the, the division to bear and that there really is, like you're saying, a division of first principles and um, we stand on opposite sides in, in certain ways, even though we love each other as people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think where the courage comes in is understanding that, you know, that, that there might, that strain is not, there might be, uh, you might not be liked for a while, you know, mm-hmm. if you're going to stand up for the truth. And, um, and, and that can't be your motivation is to, to always be liked just in the same way that it can't be your motivation to always be, you know, a, um, a troll or kind of, you know, right. antagonizing people. Like, not, neither should be our motivation, right? And so um, I think we have to expect, approach friendships deeply and with real seriousness, but also understand that, you know, ultimately, like, we are being liked is not going to be mm-hmm. the end all be all of, of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and that as things become pronounced, more Christians need to be more courageous um, because a lot of the movement is preying upon our desire to be not discredited. Um, yeah. And so if we let that control us, then we're really going to kind of lose the whole shebang. So, um, yeah, I think it's that's just all those balances, learning all the, how to balance all of those things. Yeah, that's great. And then, you know, to bring it back to the idea of home, the home is obviously good practice for that, right? learning to, to, to love and be patient, but also courageous and, 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 uh, you know, moving and engaging with people out of love and not necessarily like trying to, to win a fight. Um, yeah. That's great. Um, before we end, what's, uh, you know, we talk about a lot of this, it's, it's a lot of it's um, can become theoretical or philosophical. One of the great things I love about the theology of home books is that it, they're very practical um, and they kind of show people um, living, living out this, living out this way of life. Um, it can sometimes be still a big, a big jump though for people who have, aren't accustomed to this. Uh, if someone's anxious <laughs> about kind of bringing theology of home into their home, what's one thing they can do right now, today, uh, or this week that um, that's not too daunting uh, that can start inching closer to to bringing this into their home? I, I sort of think that the one of the most effective sort of ways to get at it is just through the idea of order um and 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 you know that's something that women and moms particular are always drawn to right there's so many things about decluttering and how to live an order more orderly life and you know it can seem like a trend almost but it is because there is some way in which we want to kind of feel that we have our lives in order in a way that's physical and visual and that might speak to a deeper and more spiritual reality, right? And so um, most of the, the the practical tips that people who are about organization or order will tell you is that it's you just have to start and in a concrete way and in the baby and with baby steps, you know. And that to me is such a beautiful analogy for the spiritual life. You know, my spiritual director is always just saying, like, just make one concrete amendment and just work on that for a while. <laughs> Rather than be like, I'm gonna do everything so much better. <laughs> it's gonna be great. You know, but I think that the home, theology of home, like that, I think is such a a perfect visual and a metaphor, but also something that really is connected to our spiritual lives. Is like how can I just start introducing and improving my daily life in these small, concrete ways. Um, so there was a lady back at, when I was um, younger, um, and she was she always said, just start with cleaning your sink. You know, go to bed every night with your dishes done and your, your and shine your sink, like wipe down your sink. And then you'll wake up and you'll think, oh, I have this little place of beautiful, clean, clean order. And it'll start creeping into more, more parts of your life. That's so great. I think I can go there first. Yeah, well, thanks so much. Um, thanks so much for that tip and also just for being with us today. It's been a great conversation and really enjoyed having you. Um, for those of you watching, listening, uh, check out the Theology of Home books. Uh, you can go to theologyofhome.com for the books and lots of other things, uh, more writing, more products. Uh, you can also find uh, the books here at catholiccompany.com. We'll have links there uh, on our homepage so you can check those out. Um, check out the books. Uh, they're really great. Um, and also look forward to 
uh, Noel's forthcoming book, Awake, Not Woke. Uh, we'll have it, and it'll be wherever books are sold. So thanks so much for, for coming on. Thanks, Christian. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Take care. Thank you for joining us on Good Catholic, Great Stories. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to leave a review and subscribe. You can listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and wherever podcasts are available. You can also watch the videos of these podcasts on our Good Catholic YouTube channel. Learn more at goodcatholic.com. Thanks for listening, and God bless.